The second big area of disciple makers is having lots of scriptures to help someone along their path to conversion. And it is great that we've all had great systems like Guard the Gospel, First Principles, Study Series. Uh, there, there are plenty of them, by the way. Let me um, let's see if I can show you even. Any, any of you ever get the uh, the First Principles app? Yeah. yeah. What? what? <laughs> For example, this first one here is the Boston Church of Christ Bible Study Series. You can see all of their different studies that are in there. Some have diagrams, little things like that. Here is uh, the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ Study Series. There you go. Cross. It's an acrostic. Huh. C. Cross. C stands for cross. You can't have the C stand for cross. Spell cross. Anyway. Uh, there, there, are, there are plenty, and I think in different parts of the country, and even different parts of the world, we've all come to realize that uh, one size doesn't fit all right. with the six or seven or eight studies that we tend to do. Um, and so in some places, I think Chicago is one of those places, they, they actually study the cross right up front with people, and it helps them to understand the love of God. And then they, they, they take it from that place. Uh, in, mm -hmm. um, in our early days as a movement, we went right to Galatians 5. Wow. <laughs> Let's just do this thing. That's transparent. Galatians 5, Acts 2, worked out great. I mean, that's back when campus ministry after campus ministry was having 100 baptisms a year. And all they knew was Galatians 5, Acts 2. Galatians 5, Acts 2. And uh, the work. What's that? Well, I, I think all of that just speaks to the fact that this really is a Holy Spirit-driven phenomenon. And we may think of ourselves as so evolved in all of these things, True. but we have to just keep continually being humbled by the fact that the, the Holy Spirit is, is doing an amazing Amen. work in preparing people. Yeah. Uh, I, I love, I, Steve said this once, that he goes, I can't believe it. I, I get paid to just like read scriptures to people and they become Christians. <laughs> like, how, how great is my life that this happens? Well, it isn't that he's just reading, but that the Holy Spirit... Excuse me, the Holy Spirit is working uh, through that and through uh, many other things. Well, what I uh, want to look at now is, again, we, we may all be coming from different places, but there are certain scriptures that if you talk to ministers, that they tend to be kind of go-to scriptures. Mm -hmm. And I, I put some of these together in the greatly applicable scripture, or scripture bank, or call it what you want, or gas, if you, if you call it that. Um, was it Lauren? Lauren was uh, jockeying to have it called SAS, but she couldn't come up with a good S uh, for it, but never mind. Super applicable. Somewhat. Somewhat. 
But so we, we, we have had this acronym of, of GAS, and so people realize what that is. We realize, um, so we've, we've kind of been stuck with it. I'm, I'm gradually weaning off, you know, so that we have street cred as a program and calling it a scripture bank. So I'll be calling it that over time uh, as, we, as we move on. But the idea of it is, is to, uh, is what Proverbs 22 says. Pay attention, listen to the sayings of the wise, apply your heart to what I teach, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have them ready on your lips. This is the, you know, be prepared to give an answer from the Old Testament. Have this ready on your lips to be able to help people with the, the, the word of God. It should have already been applied to your heart, now have it ready on your lips. And with the gas, I've, I've talked about, if you've watched any of the videos, you know that we talk about this idea of real world memorization. And that you learn the content of each scripture so you can call upon it at the necessary applicable times to meet the needs of the person that God has put in front of you. It's a huge responsibility on our part and it is not something that we want to just wing. And it is not something where we want to be handicapped because we thought it was okay just to simply be limited. Uh, yes, people can be converted just with Galatians 5, X, 2. Uh, yes, that, that is sufficiently convicting and praise God for that. Uh, however, when we know more scripture, right. it's very beneficial because then we tend not to twist scripture. Right. Yeah to meet the need that is sitting in front of us. Yeah. And once that happens, Holy Spirit's not working anymore. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he's going to have a very difficult time, probably, deciding to work through us. Mm -hmm. Well, we decide that it's going to be based on our passion or our twist of the way that we look at this scripture, rather than the fact that, how cool is this? There is a scripture that talks as specifically as we could imagine about your challenge right in front of you. Let's take a look at it. Wow, God has got you in his sights. Pretty amazing. And so, if a, uh, a seeker is struggling, for example, with coming clean, as you've been studying out sin, and you know it's right for them to come clean, and you know it's going to actually be healing and, and helpful to them if they come clean. But yet somewhere in their mind, they've decided that their strategy for winning is to conceal their sin, even from the people that they've sinned against, and that they'll actually be better off if they conceal it rather than to confess it and to expose it. So you're thinking to yourself, all right, where can I go with this? What can help them? I could share from my own life, or maybe there is a greatly applicable scripture that will be able to help them in this regard. And you realize there is, there is a scripture that talks about this very situation. And so you say, turn with me, turn with me to Proverbs 28. And as you do, you don't actually know what verse it is, but you know it's in Proverbs 28. And you know it has to do with, it ain't good to conceal, it's better to confess, everything's going to work out better in the end. And you don't, maybe don't know the exact words of the scripture, but you know that's the gist of it. Right. And, and if, if you at least know that that's the emphasis of it, and the location good enough to be able to find it, so as, as you say to them, go ahead and turn to Matthew, I mean, go ahead and turn to Proverbs 28, and as they're turning, you're turning, and hopefully they don't have the little training wheels so that they're like zipping right to it. But, <laughs> but you get to Proverbs 28 and it's taking them a while to get there. Normally you would say to them, oh, it's right after Psalms. You know, if you kind of look right down the middle, you'll see Psalms, you'll go there. But you haven't found it yet, so you ain't saying nothing. <laughs> so you're continuing looking through, you're looking through as, as they are. Uh, you're trying not to be too obvious about the fact that you're looking through. Ah, there it is. 13. Amen. And then as they're looking through, they admit, oh, here, let me help you. Let me help you with that. Here. There, there, there you go. And when you get there, we're going to be in verse 13. 
But normally you can get there well enough ahead of them that you can work all of the little fine tuning of this stuff out uh, by the time that uh, they even somewhere get into the neighborhood. And, and there you have it. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of people that are in that boat, of the boat of even as we just discussed there. I think all of a sudden you're, you're wrestling with the idea of like, hmm, I don't think it's going to go well if I actually come clean on this. I, I, I think I'm better off just kind of taking this thing to my grave. And then you have something that is so applicable come to you, and it gives the Holy Spirit the best chance to do the most specific work that he wants to do. Wow, yeah. uh, by, by knowing more scripture, knowing his scripture, mm -hmm. knowing his word, knowing his counsel, yeah. and being able to provide it as clearly as possible. Specific always trumps general mm -hmm. with regards to this. Mm -hmm. Now you could have, yes, um, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Uh, you, you, can, you can have that. Maybe there'll be some effect there. But they're thinking it's better to conceal. You're actually hitting all of that with this scripture rather than something that's more general to the point where they're, they're going to be like busted. Oh my goodness. Convicted uh, to the core. That's what we're trying to accomplish is as best as possible bring that Nathan CSI Miami you know, to bear uh, in, in these situations. And that's the whole idea of the scripture bank. Now the scripture bank for you is a start. It ought to be something that becomes your own. And that when you find a cool one, you can't wait to tell other like-minded folks that are eager to know the word of God and to apply it and to be disciple makers. You can't wait to grab them and say, whoa, 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 did you, did you see this one regarding the word of God? I saw one just the other day that I hadn't seen in a while. I thought, ah, oh, that's so fantastic. I can't wait to write it down and put it into, into some you know, kind of section of my notebook where I can you know, have it ready to use. Now, uh, even as you add, you want to make sure that you're not subtracting. You know, Arthur Conan Doyle had the theory of the brain that you can only jam so much in there like an attic. And if you want to put something else in, something else has got to come out. Hopefully that's not the case with Scripture. And that your base of scripture, you know, you've all probably gone through guard the gospel of some sort or another. I hope anyway. Uh, and, and through that, you learned a whole lot of scripture through guard the gospel or first principles or whatever your study series was called. And those are important to make sure that they don't kind of start to fall away from your memory. And one of the things that I, I often encourage people to do is to have a, a continual challenge of yourself on, uh, well, if the middle of the month is called the Ides, right? The Ides of March is March 15th. Is on the, on the middle of each month, um, on, on the Ides, let that be an acronym as well for I Deny Entropy. And um, entropy is where everything goes to a greater state of disorder in your life unless acted upon by an outside force. And the outside force is discipline that you put into practice and you have a, a regular time each month where you just go over it again and it is amazing, it's just quick. I mean, you, you just run through those eight studies or so, you know, kind of the classic guard the gospel studies and look at those scriptures without the context behind them, just look at the listing of those scriptures and, and to know, all right, I, I got it, I've got those. But then as your scripture bank grows, you would do that more and more with more scripture. We're disciple makers. We, we need these. Yeah, that's right. We need to know these. This isn't something that, ah, oh, I'll get around to it, or I'll cram it, or I'll make the big event of it. I'll be undisciplined, and then suddenly at the last second, I'll pull it out, because I always do, because that's how I operate in my life. It's not, it's not going to actually be as beneficial as really having a deliberateness about us of really having these things ready on our lips, really having been applied to our hearts and ready to be deployed for the great phenomenal work of helping people come to know God. Uh, as, as I mentioned too, this is just the beginning, but you're going to have other areas 
that will crop up again and again as you study the Bible with people. Individualism, selfishness, apathy, apathy with regards to seeking God, no fear of God. If you're in the teen ministry, you better have a really good fear of God study uh, to help open their eyes and that this culture of self-esteem patting on the back continually uh, is, is not actually the path towards baptism. Uh, a purposefulness in life, boldness, worship, pride, humility, grace, whatever it might be, you, you need to make sure that if that's something that seems to be keep cropping up, just put a little page in the back of your journal and drop them in. And drop them in with maybe just a, a, a jot of note or maybe you write them all out, whatever works best for you, that they become applied to your heart and ready on your lips. This, this is the Word of God. This is what we do. This is how we are actually made to be uh, even more effective in wielding the, uh, the great word of truth. Um, and, and, but as you come across good ones, share them. You tweet stupid stuff. You take pictures of your food and you send it to people. <laughs> take a picture of that scripture and send it to somebody. Uh, write it out. I don't care that you just made that and it's going to be really good when you eat that thing. But if you have like a cool scripture that you find really helps with regards to a conviction of righteousness, I'll be like, man, I'm going to retweet that thing. But, <laughs> so, we've got, we, we've got some here and, and um, a lot of these are, are familiar. In, in, you know, it looks like an overwhelming list when you realize, oh yeah, Matthew 7, uh, see, knock, nah, yeah, I got it. Matthew 7, 13, narrow road, yeah, I've, I've been there. Uh, Matthew 13, parables, right? It's the treasure in the field, the pearl of great price. Matthew 13 is where all those parables are, so that, that helps me know it's in the parable section. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom. How many times have I had that applied to me? I should know that by now. <laughs> That's the go-to scripture. Yeah. It'll be your go-to scripture on quizzes too, I realize. Everything is Matthew 6.33. So. <laughs> yeah. Acts 8.26, what that's about? Why, why is that the seeking God section? <laughs> exactly, because he, he's a model, model seeker. Uh, what's uh, what's Hebrews eleven six about? And what must you believe? And he rewards those. That's a great aspect of seeking God, and it's okay that there are rewards for those who seek Him. Uh, Jeremiah twenty nine, the most used and often most misused of uh, yes. all, all, all seeking scriptures. When we rip it out of context, and knit it onto your uh, pillowcase. Uh, uh, X X seventeen, equal one, right? There you go. No, he's not far from any one of us. Luke, Luke 13, 22 to 27. What, what does that one work well with? Matthew 7. Right. Because are only a few going to be saved? Because he, he had said that. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 is good one with uh, athletes. Yes. Amen. Or mathletes. <laughs> Second Chronicles 15. Why is that a good one? Yep, say, say it again. Yeah, it's a scary one, too. Uh, uh, 17, 10, and 11 is a good one. Bereans, yeah. And they're, they're great seekers, but also it's a great way to even kind of fold in the idea of the Word of God with our seeking. And sometimes it's not a bad idea to fold those two together. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, what's that one about? The, 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 kind of up, up here somewhere, right? Heart, mind, soul, and strength? No? No, I mean, Jesus is quoting it. Is that where he got it? 
<laughs> I just thought he came up with it. Uh, Daniel 9. Why is that a cool one? Uh huh. Okay, yeah, some, some, some very real practicals there. Who has some other Seeking God scriptures that you find pretty, pretty helpful? Yes? John 8, 31 32. Okay, the Jews who believed in him, right? So that's a good word one as well. Um, but if you, if you hold to my teachings, so that's, that's a great one. What else? Anybody else? Yeah, in the back? Uh, Psalm 10, 4. What you got there? Where he talks about the wicked, that there's no room, there's no, no room in their head, or no, no room to make thoughts to see God, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a turn there. I'm not going to work that one out. You got there too much. Marcel! Ah! Gotcha. That, that is a good one. Uh, along with along with uh, all who, who call on the Lord from a pure... Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, I misquoted it. Right, but it's, it's a community sense of seeking God, which is which is a cool one there. Yeah. Uh, so that was 2 Timothy 2, 22. 22. Um, an example is Joshua 24. Like if, if choose today if you're going to seek God or if you're going to... Oh, it. great. What's, what's another scripture very similar to that? Choose today who you're going to say. There you go. He nailed it. Deuteronomy 31. I now hold before you life and prosperity, death and destruction. Choose now life. Um, any any others? Yeah. I, I, I would help you jot these down, by the way. These are, these are all great. Luke 11, where Jesus says to clean us out and be judged. He came all over the world, but now someone greater than Solomon is here. Okay. She, she made such a huge effort. We're, we're actually... Expected to do that and then some? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, for for uh, kind of agnostic folks that are kind of wrestling with this, what's a good one? John, yeah, say it. John 7, 17. John 7, 17, yeah. yeah. But if you do His will, then you will know whether these words are from God. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, a very helpful one. Rather than trying to prove, 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 just put it in action and you see. Ryan. Uh, it's Acts 17. What's that? Um, uh, Acts 17. Well, it, it, and we already have it in here. That section of it, I don't think, is in in there. So he now calls he now calls on all men to repent. That. Okay, it's, it's also Acts 17 though. So. Okay, uh, so. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So men are without excuse in Romans 1, like I don't know. 28 or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where is it? 19? 20. Okay. Great. Yeah, I, that, that's, that one, you know, that one is also when, when people are upset about, you know, the third world tribe in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, that, that ends up being helpful too. So, uh, yeah, Trey? Uh, first Chronicles 28, where David is uh, making plans for the temple. Uh, and he talks to his son Solomon. Talks about acknowledging God and serving Him wholeheartedly, the Lord with a willing mind. The Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek Him, you will be found by Him. He will by you. Oh, great. So, okay. First Chronicles 28. So, very cool. Anybody else have a burning one they want to share before we move on? Yeah. Um, Matthew 6, 21, where your treasures are your heart will be. That's actually a really good one, too, because it's if someone is apathetic and they're, they're trying to figure out, like, I... I don't know, I just don't have a passion for this. Maybe once my heart is there, then, then I'll really get after this. And Jesus actually there says just the opposite. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So in other words, invest in the heavenly, which you can do through these Bible studies, through this worship, through fellowship opportunities, through prayer, through, through your personal Bible study. Uh, and that, those are all ways to invest in, in heaven. And when you do... Your heart will be there also. Uh, it's, a, it's a different tense showing that first the action occurs, then the heart change occurs. Rather than most people try to go by their feelings saying, I'm just not feeling it. So, uh, amen. Good, good, good one there. So, very helpful.
what what I use a lot too, as a matter of fact. Being very really helpful. Yeah. Um, James four seven. Come near God. Oh, great. That's a nice promise. So, amen. All right. Well, th th there's a good sense there, and all of these end up being really, really helpful. Sometimes the Seeking God study is a study that you have to do in the middle of the studies to kind of re-energize right. yeah. the studies. So all, all of these are not just a, hey, feel good. Some of these might actually be a reproof that'll occur after having studied out sin or something and somebody starts to drag their feet. Yeah. So it's a, a good, good uh, reason to have these scriptures ready on your lips. So the word, I put slash feelings in, in this little section here, but uh, Jude three, why is that a why is that a good one? The faith that was once for all delivered. Uh, for some groups that think that there's ongoing additions to the Bible, at this point Jude says the faith has once for all been delivered. Second Timothy two fifteen. What's that? Workman approved, need not, okay, correctly handles the word of truth. Uh, and four, two to three. Preach. Be prepared in season, out of season, with, with the word of God uh, for that. Uh, Second Peter 1, 19 to 21. The King James said, uh, no prophecy came about by the prophet's own private interpretation. Yeah. Uh, that's why the what was it? The first principles study series talks about the word interpretation being such a, a bad word, um, and, and we actually use interpretation all the time through this class. But interpretation is it is simply just making something clear. Uh, it's it's when Ezra comes before the people on the great scaffolding and is able to preach the word, and then he interprets it for them. Uh, and so no prophecy of Scripture comes about by the, by the prophet's own thoughts, so to speak, in 2 uh, Peter 1. Anyway, that's a little bit of an odd background from our movement with that Scripture. Uh, John 7, 17, we already talked about that, that and 8, 31. A lot of the, God, uh, the word Scriptures end up being good-seeking Scriptures. I, I oftentimes just combine the two if I'm going to have a Bible study with someone. Um, James 1, 22 to 25. Anybody know what that's about? Yeah. <laughs> I better. <laughs> Here we go. We better now, right? Yeah. It sounds so familiar. What? Oh. Um, yeah, throughout the state of Virginia, a lot of us actually uh, went, went through a campaign where we, we actually tried to put something into practice every single day. Really, really great. Uh, what's Mark 7 about? Tradition. Tradition. What's the parallel scripture to that one? Yes, Matthew 15. Um, Ezekiel 33. Sure, that's like that's like when you're after service and you're like, man, that, that preacher sure did preach the word nice. Boy, that was terrific. But you've been studying with this guy and you know what he's been up to. And yeah, it's, it's like... Do you mind if we just turn to this right now to see the irony of what it is that you're saying? First uh, Thessalonians 2. That's a cool one. What's that about? As it really is the Word of God. Yeah. Uh, John 12. Fantastic. There is a judge for the one that does not accept me. There you go. First Timothy four sixteen. <laughs> Men. Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. That's probably what you memorize because it's like early in the garden of the gospel. Yeah, it was a popular memory scripture. Uh, how about some of these proverbs? And these, these actually come into the feeling side of it. The uh, the, the reason that I, I have these bundled together is sometimes. For, for someone that is either feelings oriented, but they say they go by the Bible, or some people in some of the more charismatic branches of Christianity also tend to put a lot more stock in things other than the Word mm -hmm. itself. And experiences end up being elevated near to the level of Scripture. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes experiences will moderate scripture as well. And when, when anything like that happens, it's helpful to have some scriptures that will help you that. Proverbs 3, anybody know what that one was about? Don't lean on your own understanding. understanding. Okay, good. Uh, 14, 12. But in the end. Yep. 16, 2. Reveals the motives. Great. 28, 26. Anybody got that one? <coughs> What's that? I mean, as a gas, as a uh, as a scripture bank one. Thank you for reading it. <laughs> uh, tr tr trusting in your own understanding. Trusting in yourself. Uh, Twenty-eight nine. Anybody got that? Did you hear that one? That's actually a uh, pretty intense one. Well, since we're reading, why don't you go ahead and read it? Okay. I said, if anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable. Wow. Um, so much for feelings versus the word there. Uh, and uh, 30, 5 and 6. Uh, amen. Corinthians 4 4, kind of familiar with that one, right? Conscience is clear, it's not about your conscience. Uh, 2 Samuel 6, why do you think that one's in there? Do you know what 2 Samuel 6 is about? Uzzah and the ark? And it, it, it seems as though he's doing a good thing, right? The ark is about to fall over, and let me steady it. And it makes for a good Bible talk where you say, what will God do next to Uzzah? Uh, reward him? Thank him? No, he strikes him dead. Because his word was clear. Uh, even, even though impulses or compulsion or feelings may actually make you think otherwise, a lot of what the Bible says can be counter counterintuitive uh, to our minds, especially when our mind is not informed by the word of God. Um, amen. We live in a new covenant too, where the woman who touches the robe of Christ is instead healed uh, by, by. Well, didn't say anywhere not to touch him though. So. <laughs> um, Jeremiah seventeen nine. Yeah. Heart is deceitful above all things. Second Peter three sixteen. As are what? Other scripture. That's why it's also important. Because it is starting to establish that Paul's, Paul's teaching is scripture. In case somebody wants to quibble about, well, you know, is this really scripture? When, when he's uh, talking about it. Uh, Psalm 119, just go anywhere through that. It's just kind of exalting in the word. Oh, how I love your law. Uh, how can a man keep his way pure? I mean, a lot of, a lot of great stuff. That's there in that one. And uh, Matthew 13 is, I mean, what a great one, the parable of the sower. Uh, but they probably got exposed to that in three other Bible talks already before they go <laughs> to, to, to study. Who's got some other good passages on the Word of God? Yes? What is it? Ah, okay. Great. Yes? One that was really helpful when I was studying the Bible was actually Daniel 2. The whole, well, it was when we had back in the day when we had the human study. But I, just that whole section about how um, the four kingdoms were prophesied mm -hmm. and how they came to be, it helped me to really solidify that the, the word of God is true. There was some, some historical veracity. Hmm. Yeah. That, I mean, that is, a, it's a very inspiring study, obviously, when we when we look at that. Um, so, great, great, great. Yeah. Uh, Joshua one more talks about meditating on day and night. Yep. Okay, great one. In the back. Jeremiah 23, 23. <coughs> what you got there? His word is like a hammer and it breaks rocks. Jeremiah 
Isaiah 23. Yeah, right. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, where God is sharper than the Lord's sword. Is that not in there? No. That's my psychic scar. <laughs> I just wanted to leave it, leave it out. Uh, just saying. Yes, Matt. Anyway, that ought to be in there, obviously. It's, it's, especially about the idea of being uncovered and exposed. It's, it's all, judgment is going to be based on the word. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 22, you are an heir because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Ah, 22, 29. That's a good one. Yeah. I like Matthew um, 4, when he's being tempted. And, uh, you know, Satan was uh, mm -hmm. destroying the scriptures, but he was always talking about the word really was the word of God. Aha. But on every word of the Lord. So, that's a great one. Yes, Bethany. Uh, Matthew 7, 24, about the wise and foolish children. Can't just hear the word. Oh, that's, that's fantastic, too. That's ought to be in there, really, right? <coughs> consider, consider it in. Uh, yes? Uh, like 2 Peter 1, verse 16, a little bit beforehand, where Peter says we got all of the stories, and expand that backwards a little bit, where eyewitnesses sit back. Aha. Uh -huh. Eyewitnesses. Yeah, that's a cool concept to, to have there. Um, anyway, th those are all helpful. Let's... But let me talk for a second about this idea of a, a Jesus study. Some... Sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. It, if people are, are reading through a gospel, you can just simply make that their charge. So, for example, you've studied out seeking God and the Word. Maybe it's a hybrid. You give them the charge to look at both. And then having studied out both of those, you um, give them the charge to read through Mark or Matthew or whatever it might be. And while they go through it, often what I ask is that every chapter capture something that astounds you about Jesus. Yeah. Just one thing in each chapter. They're going to have a really long list of really cool things about Jesus. Essentially, what the Jesus study is, is just cool things about Jesus. Yeah. Catching them in the act of doing his great stuff over and over again. I, I have a little section that I like to go to when I, when I do do this study. I, I like to look kind of around like Mark 6, 7, 8, that, that section where Jesus is just going from one side of the Sea of Galilee to another, just, I mean, whooping it up and doing amazing stuff on yes. one side and the next. And it just keeps going. And in Mark, you know, it's all kind of rapid fire and amazing. Uh, but if you do a Jesus study, don't let it just be something that you gain because it's a list somewhere. Make it your study. Yeah. Yeah. That ought to be really like, what really excites you about Jesus? It doesn't have to be all in one section. Although that's kind of cool for the person to realize, wow, we just looked at this little section. We toured it, did a survey of Jesus. That was amazing. Yeah. Uh, but we're not calling people to be disciples of discipleship. Yeah. We're calling them to be disciples of Jesus. Amen. That's why th this would be rather important. I don't want to go through a whole bunch of scriptures because hopefully we all have like a lot of scriptures on that one. But with regards to discipleship, we know the usual sus suspects. Acts 11, Mark 1. I put Mark 8 down, 34 to 38. What's the parallel of that one? <laughs> Luke 9, yeah, 23. In, in 27. Why do you think I have Mark 8 down? I lose the word daily, which is not good. But what, what, what do you think, Josh? It shows he's talking to a whole group of people, not to the apostles. <laughs> yeah, because you have context in Mark 8 that's really helpful. It says he called the crowds to him along with his disciples and said to them all, so this standard of discipleship that he's about to lay out <coughs> applies not only to those that are gathered in real tight, who may be the disciples already, and then as those concentric rings go outward of commitment and interest in Jesus among the crowd, even to that furthest fringe, he has said to them all, yeah. if anybody wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Uh, and, and so you have it. So that's why I find that one to be helpful. Uh, we're we're going to go through some of these, but uh, Luke 9, that's follow me, birds, death, den, dead, buried, hand to the plow, 
Um, <laughs> Luke 11, 1 to 4. Why is that one a, a helpful one? Yeah. Because it shows that prayer is not natural. And if the person that you're studying with doesn't really know how to pray or doesn't find prayer natural, well, they can take comfort in the fact that even Jesus' disciples recognize that it was a learned ability rather than just some natural ability that springs from within our amazing hearts. Uh, Luke 13, we've already discussed that one, but that's the make every effort rather than just try. Matthew 25, parable um, that we have there. Anybody know which parable that one is? Sheep and the goats? Could be. Could be the ten virgins? Could be. Uh, I think it's sheep and the goats. Uh, but it shows that what, what disciples do. They, they take care of people. They, they don't just talk a good religious game. Uh, Colossians 3. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The, the, um, uh, 2 Kings 7. Anybody know what's there? Is that in the gas? It may not even be in the gas. No. Okay. It is twice. Well, you know. Tape was happening. Um, oh, it is twice. You're right. The survey of the book of Acts, you don't need to memorize all of those except for 8. Uh, well, 2, 41 to 47, and 8, 1 and 4. Why is 8, 1 and 4 so helpful? Not just the apostles preached the word. Exactly, yeah. Um, what's another passage that will help you to realize that Jesus wasn't calling just the apostles to preach the word? Luke 10, not the 72. Yeah. Okay, the 72, because they clearly weren't all apostles. 1 John chapter 1, he who claims to live must walk as Jesus walked. Okay, but let, let me get that. Something that would specifically call people to go out and preach. Matthew 28. Matthew what? 28. 28 is, yes, is a big one. Because you're being commanded to teach them to obey everything. What's included in that command? Well, to go and make disciples. Right. You can't pull that one away. Yep. Another great one is Luke 9. We'll talk more about that. Uh, 57 to uh, 62, 61. Because when were the apostles established? Right before that. I mean, right before that. And, and now he's saying to the man who says to him, when well, he says to the man, follow me, he says, uh, I'm going to go bury my father. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That was equivalent to following him, as he restates it. So, you have those. Sin, this is definitely an area where you want to add and add and add and add. I think I've even added some uh, on here as I was like looking at some stuff today. Uh, if you study the Bible with uh, dads, moms, married couples, you, you definitely want to make sure that you're dealing with those situations when, when you get to this. Uh, I mean, that's why I think I've even added here, because this was actually just a Bible study I had the other day with a dad. Uh, I added Ephesians 6.4, where it talks about, do not exacerbate your children, uh, or do not embitter your children with your, you know, with your harshness, so to speak. That was like so convicting, so convicting to him, uh, as a, a, a realizing, oh my goodness, there is a lot of mess I do have, now that I start to look at all the areas of my life. Uh, obviously looking at the idea to, to love your wife, uh, to wash her with water is with the word. Um, to respect your husband, uh, to submit to your husband. I mean, th these are all rather important ones. The, um, uh, the sins that we've got here, sometimes to replicate, one, one that I, I added here was Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. The reason I added that one is because it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Uh, Deb and I were just talking about this yesterday, that we don't actually have a whole lot of scriptures that deal with being bitter. Mm -hmm. But yet there is a lot of resentment that people hold on to that need to be uh, exercised. Hebrews 12, 15 is a pretty good one too. Do you know what that one says? Let no bitter root uh, grow among you and defile many. The, but the idea of a bitter root there may be one more of... Um, of faithlessness. Uh, it's, the, it's the bitterness of despair. Uh, you think of Mara. Uh, 
you know, of, of Naomi, call me Mara. That, that type of bitterness is not, ah, oh, I hate that God. No, it's, it's, it's just a sadness, a deep sadness that, is, that has overcome her to the point of almost um, uh, feeling powerless um, and um, apathetic. So Hebrews 12 is a bit more about that, whereas uh, Ephesians 4 is definitely about um, not having resentment because it then says, forgive as the Lord forgave you in, in, in verse 32. Uh, so that's a, a very helpful one. I think I've even added like Matthew 6 in here that if you do not forgive your brother, then the Lord will not forgive you. Yeah. That's pretty big. Yeah. And, and, and those end up being pretty large issues that are easy to kind of pass over. Yeah. Uh, a whole other section of scriptures that are important to have, and I'll, I'll share these studies with you, is the idea of pride. Pride and arrogance. It's the big one, right? I mean, it's so huge. And, and so it's, uh, it's important to have a lot of those ready, ready, ready on your lips. Because they will come up over and over and over again. Uh, anybody want to share a couple of pride scriptures that you use that you, you find helpful? Uh, yep. Psalm 36. Psalm 36. Sure. That you flatter yourself too much to detect or even hate your own sin. Yeah. Proverbs 16, verse 5, ESV version says, Everyone who is arrogant for our is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Bam. Marcel. the one with the king and yeah. Uzziah, yeah, <laughs> became proud. He's the one who like built like the machineries of war. Yeah, that was a cool oh, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but when his heart became proud, yeah. off he went. Glenn. I like uh, Galatians six. Fathers, if anyone is caught in this sin, you are spiritual to restore it gently, but keep watch, lest you be tempted. And it says, for if anyone thinks he is something, he is nothing. He deceives. Ah, so the self-deceit part of pride is, is one that we have to try to find a way through. So where well, you have something that speaks of Psalm 36, Galatians 6, something that talks about the blinding aspects of pride proves to be pretty helpful. And then after you've spent some time exposing the blinding aspects of pride to the point that their eyes are open, then you can hit them with things like what Alana shared of, wow, now that I see it, look what it is that I am before the Lord. A stench in his nostrils. Yes, so, if somebody's defensive, <laughs> yep. stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we're, we're the grafted in branches, and who, who are we to think we're all that? So for sure. Now, the difficulty with applying that in a Bible study is, is that person is likely not grafted into anything at that moment. So we, we'd have to twist it a bit, because they're not in it uh, just, just yet. It'd be good to apply in a, you know, counseling with, with one another, though. Yeah. First Peter 5, 5, God goes and proud of Yep. I was... Uh, yeah, but that, that is a great one, and it's um, it's repeated, right? And it's repeated in, in the uh, book before it, James. James. Um, yeah. Um, in Proverbs sixteen five, the Lord says, "All the proud of heart, be sure of this; they will not go unpunished." Still like it. <laughs> Still for it. Yes. Uh, Daniel four. Yes. Ah, yep. Pride around though. So th these are these are all helpful. Obviously, we've had some experiences with pride, but <laughs> if you do not if you do not have a long, 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 long list of pride scriptures, then you will you will find yourself frustrated because you will encounter it with probably every Bible study and every Christian. So there you go, um, and we're gonna have a competition who has the best list of pride scriptures. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, 
take take through a couple of these a little bit a little bit quick right now because we're going to go over some of these in a bit. But with with repentance, um, the scriptures in repentance, similar to what I, I was just kind of referring to here with pride. Once somebody realizes they're proud, then you can bring all the really hard scriptures regarding pride to them. But if you just say to them, for example, Proverbs sixteen five. Uh, which, which talks about that you are detestable in the sight of God because you're proud, well, they might say, well, yeah, but that's if I am proud. Like, I mean, there's a lot of scriptures like that. The, the hard part is actually finding the scriptures that will help them to see their pride and to understand that pride does blind and that it is difficult to see your own pride. And the scriptures that speak of that is where you start with the pride study. Or maybe even scriptures that speak of humility and pride and maybe play act or, or replay to them humility versus pride along the way. Um, but also then with judgment. When, when somebody is needing to recognize that they are actually in a position to await the wrath of God, um, there is not actually a whole lot that we study in the early scriptures that tell us whether someone is going to hell or not. But the one block of scriptures that do is repentance. Yeah. Because if you do not, the axe is already at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. <laughs> so. Do you really say it like that? What's that? Do you really say it like that? No. It's our family Devo. <laughs> But uh, like when you do family devos, you tend to like quote yourselves like in, in, in weird ways during that. Uh, Jesus says, if you do not repent, you too will all perish. God wants none to perish, but all to come to repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance that brings salvation. Anyway, Many, many, many of our scriptures with regards to repentance, even Romans 2, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. But the whole context of that is actually awaiting judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, if it, that if it wasn't for his patience, yeah. letting us get to repentance, we're, we're going to actually have hell to pay, in a sense. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot, a lot with that. But you, you can't just kind of bring it all from that standpoint. What helps is similar with pride, is to help someone, help someone understand what repentance is, and then once they understand what repentance really is, it's often actually quite exciting and enlightening to them, and, and then to help them see, now that they understand the fullness of the phenomenon of repentance, of whether they've repented or not, and when they can come to a biblical conclusion that if this is the case, that they've not repented, then it's time to say, all right, then with that kind of clarity, it's time for us to take a look at some things. And then you break all of those other scriptures that we were just talking about, so that they can come to a place of conviction with regards to judgment. Amen. Baptism, we, uh, we know these, we'll talk about these a, a good bit. Um, Holy Spirit, the, these, are, these are helpful. You know, by the time we get to baptism, Holy Spirit, church, at this point in time, you know, if you think back to that diagram, this is all just good news. Yeah. 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 Like, the hard work has been done. Yeah. Yeah. And if all of a sudden you find yourself at the church study, and you've not, like, established some stuff, yeah. then something went really wrong earlier. Right. Yeah. That's right. If you're at the baptism study, and you still haven't established some stuff, it, it didn't go well earlier right. with regards to judgment. Because you probably are not going to really convince them through the baptism study. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. will argue, and then they'll walk away. Yeah. Just how it goes, sadly. Yeah. Uh, but you can actually have such greater success through the repentance study of, of helping someone see whether they've really repented or not. Um, likewise, with, if you're trying to convict them about like what's the right church by saying there's only one church... <laughs> Well, they're like, yeah, there's only one church. So, but what makes it yours? You know, the, the scripture says there's only one church. If we're, if we're going about that in the church study, we have completely failed at where we needed to be 
early on in the conversion process. And I say this now as just little teasers. We'll deal with this as we, as we make our way through um, the whole idea of conviction. I, I had some faith and obedience scriptures. Oh, these are ones that I've actually found helpful. Like in my back of my book, you know, I have, I have a couple other sections here. Um, perseverance and judgment. You know, the idea that, you know, even once saved, always saved. Why do you think 1 Timothy 3.6 is such a helpful scripture for that? Anybody know what it talks about? It's about deacon, yeah. And actually, it's even about an overseer at this point. But he must not be what? A neophyte. It's actually a neophyte in the Greek. But he, <laughs> he must not be a recent convert. Or else what will happen to him? He become conceited and fall under the same condemnation as the devil. So the person, on one hand, is being described as an actual convert. A convert who is doing so well at an early age that he's being considered as a leader in the church. But be careful because that person, a true convert who's about to be appointed a leader, can become conceited and fall under the same condemnation as the devil. Once saved, always saved? Not there. <laughs> Uh, so, when, uh, when, when you arrive tomorrow, we're going to have just a little bit of a, a gut check on do you know your gas? And so, what will happen is, I won't say to you, hey, what's, what's that 1 Timothy 3.6 about? It won't be that. Why? Because nobody says that when you're sitting with them in a Bible study. <laughs> They say crazy stuff to you. <laughs> and then you've got to improvise and have the most applicable scripture to be able to help them out of that jam or help them through that misconception or convict them back onto the path of beautiful salvation that is awaiting them. It's a big deal. Uh, and this is, this is, I think what will really get you to a point where you will have every confidence to study the Bible with people where you're excited, no matter who it was. And as a result, you'll ask more people to study the Bible. You'll try to make more Bible studies happen uh, because you know that you've done the hard work of really wrestling to have a big scripture bank to be able to help you. And you become discerning of what is going to be the most specific, most applicable, most convicting scripture um, with, with regards uh, to that. So, for example, if someone says to you, well, salvation, you know what? What is salvation anyway? Colossians 1. Ah, way to bring it. Is it up there? It's not. Good job. Uh, redemption is the forgiveness of sins, is, is what Colossians says. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So forgiveness of sins is not just some isolated activity. Forgiveness of sins is when we are redeemed to the Lord. Uh, and some people actually argue that, well, it does say, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. But is that really salvation? I think I was saved when I said the sinner's prayer, but then I had my sins forgiven when I did this or that. Right. Well, that's a good scripture to actually help someone to not pull apart uh, activities that are actually meant to be uh, put together. So, let me, um, I'm gonna, let me run past a bunch of these, if I can. Yeah. <coughs> End of the day, Friday, you did it! Yay! That was only supposed to be a marker slide for me. So, tomorrow morning, we're back here at 9, and... 